Hey everybody, welcome back to another exciting episode of the Stash Report from the Stash Project. Today is May 7th, 2018, and I'd advise you to not even bother going getting yourself a beverage for this, because we're not going to be here that long. Uh, as most of you know from watching our uh, show last week, that I realized was a little late due to the recording glitch, uh, there was Golden Week this past uh, week. Really, it's really it was four days off scattered over the week um, in Japan, which meant, of course, everything was closed. And uh, the model companies are right now mostly in preparation for the Shizuka Hobby Show, which will be starting on Thursday. Which means next week's show should be interesting because we should get uh, a bunch of pictures to show you from various sources. Uh, but in the meantime, really, we only have two things to talk about, and they're both uh, relating to new kits uh, that are coming up. First up, uh, out of Hasegawa, we got the built um, production, I guess. I think still technically I think this is a test shot, because some of the windows, uh, the side windows don't look exactly like they're very clear, like they're polished out yet in the mold. So this is probably a pre-production run that they've assembled and built up into the model they'll have on display at Shizuka this week. And that is the upcoming uh, Nissan Skyline GTSR Calsonic race car for the Japanese Touring Car Championship Series from 1989. Uh, so obviously 1989, this car is going to be very, very close to factory spec as far as uh, its trim. And it's like, you know, the fact that it has side repeater lights and... Uh, you know, the headlights and taillights from the actual car and, and all of the car's window glass and, and side, you know, trim and things like that. Uh, you know, you start thinking about race cars, you start thinking about things with, you know, plexiglass windows and things like that. And to a certain extent, uh, this car may have had plexiglass uh, door windows, but it didn't have, you know, it, it's not a modern, modern race car. It's 1980s. Got to step back in time a little bit here. Uh, the parts you see that are a little bit different from on this, that are going to be different uh, from the civilian kit that's going to be coming out in July, of course, are the wheels and the uh, slicks. Uh, you also have a tow hook uh, sitting in the front end, a tow hook sitting in the back end. Uh, there are uh, latches to hold the trunk shut. Um you know, you can see even the, the car even has, you know, the rear window defogger and has the wiper for the back. Um, you start looking at the, there's a picture here of the chassis. Uh, you see a little bit more of the race spec-ness, uh, if you will, uh, of this. Uh, the little things that look like a uh, uh, little, uh, I'm trying to think what, <laughs> what sausage looks like that. It, slipped, it was there and it slipped my mind. But anyway, the little white things with the black inserts in them are the air jacks uh, mounts. Um, of course, there's like a racing radiator to it, a racing fuel tank, uh, some and some brake ducts uh, in the back there, as well as obviously having a side exiting exhaust system. So those are going to be your basically your race-specific parts. I believe there's also some race-specific uh, stance as far as the suspension goes, which is probably achieved by uh, the wheel spindles and how the brakes attach, which is how they've traditionally done their uh, race car, civilian car conversion kits. And obviously it has uh, beefier brakes uh, on this as well. So there's that, just a little something, something to look at. <clears throat> and then we also got this news, and this is a new kit announcement uh, from Bell Kits. Uh, they're proudly declaring that they have the licensing now to do the Citron C3 World Rally Championship car, specifically driven by Sebastian Loeb in his return to the World Rally Championship car, uh, World Rally Championship series rather, uh, for the Rally Mexico this year in 2018. Now, this picture will show you the actual car is kind of crowdy, but there's only so many pictures of, of this rally that, that are online right now. It just happened a few weeks ago. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a little, little car there. I don't know what else to say about that. I, it really doesn't, you know, being a Citroen, it doesn't really necessarily look like very many other things. Maybe like a slightly squashed and elongated Volkswagen Beetle, maybe. Uh, but for people who are fans of modern rally cars, uh, Sebastian Loeb personally, uh, you're going to have a new, uh, another new modern rally car coming out of Belkitz this year. <coughs> No release date on this. Um, I'm suspecting it'll probably be a end of the year um, as far as the release date because right now you still, of course, have the uh, 2017 Monte Carlo uh, winning uh, 
Ford Focus that has to that is you know currently in production. There's this kit that is you know now uh, in you know at least in tooling phase. Uh, and then there's also another kit uh, that they have not officially announced, but you know if you pay enough attention to Belkit's Facebook feed, you probably know what it is. Uh, but like I said, for uh, you know in a little while now, Belkit's has been doing some historic rally cars. You did the Mark One Escort. You have the Group B Opel Manta. And, uh, you know, you had a couple of Volkswagen kits that were more or less reissues of an existing kit. So now you get some new tool, uh, modern rally cars. And so um, I don't necessarily think I have any particularly strong friends that are all like, ooh, modern rally cars, yay, per se. But I know you guys are out there, so I know you'll be, uh, you know, happy to have another modern rally car that's not a Volkswagen. <laughs> or a Ford, for that matter, but specifically not a Volkswagen. A lot of people complained about the Volkswagen being, well, hopefully it's something else. Well, you know, tooling exists. Modify the tooling. It's cheaper than creating a new one and things like that. So uh, that was sort of unexpected. Like I said, we, we know that there's another modern rally car kit in the works at Bell Kits, but this is not it. And uh, so, like I said, having that sort of pop up was uh, a little unexpected, but a nice treat, again, if you're into modern rally cars. I'm more than likely will pick one up just because uh, at this point I've bought so many modern you know, rally cars that I'm just giving up on the whole idea that I don't build rally cars. So anyway guys that is it. There's your short show um, and uh, you know tomorrow is the closing date for the big rebel sale and of course people are uh, you know running around in panic little circles trying to figure out what's going to happen. Um, Scott, who runs uh, Elm City Hobbies up in Canada, posted in the last video about what he was told by his suppliers, which jives with what I've heard uh, in terms of the fact that, you know, they need to reestablish a, a importer here in the United States. Um, you know, they probably could ship things over in small batches to distributors uh, the same way, uh, you know, any international company would. You just have a freight forwarder pick up all the, you know, customs and brokerage fees. Um, but that also adds cost that compared to somebody who has a customs license and brokerage <laughs> account the way that Revell, uh, you know, Habico did. Uh, and Revell USA earlier before Habico bought out uh, Revell of Germany. Uh, so we'll see. Uh, his supplier, can, you know, in case you didn't read the conversation we had yesterday, last night, uh, his supplier is saying that it'll probably be 60 to 90 days before they have a established uh, base of operations in terms of an importer here in the United States to get their kits back on the market. Um, in the meantime, if you want Revell of Germany kits, uh, they are, of course, available out of Japan right now. The yen is a little stronger than it was last year. Uh, still not overwhelming. Still not a problem where it's cheaper to buy, US, uh, Jap buy Japanese kits in the United States. Uh, but the price on, like, Revell Germany kits out of, like, Hobby Link Japan, for example, is probably a few dollars more than you would necessarily pay for them, depending on who you're buying them through. There's that caveat. Uh, and, of course, you can always go on eBay and buy through uh, various vendors in Great Britain and Germany and over in Europe, although you're really going to get stuck with the shipping on some of those. you got to watch your shipping on on especially out of Germany and, like, Italy and things like that. The shipping can very quickly run you more than the kit does. Um, so, like, the Pirelli uh, Anniversary GTI kit that's supposed to come out later this summer, um, the, your pre-orders are, are, are available for that at Hobby Link Japan, Hobby Search, all the sort, you know, Japanese places we always recommend. Um, and, of course, like I said, you'll be able to buy it through European uh, vendors, but as far as getting it here in the United States, per se, it's probably going to, you know, end up being the fall, uh, and with all likelihood. And that doesn't, of course, get into the whole dog and pony show about what the U.S. market kits are going to, you know, is going to happen with those. Um, I really have to say that from outside, ex outside appearances, other than the stuff that was already announced, your Grease Ford, your 69 Mustang, the, uh, well, the Ford GT Le Mans car, but that's a Revell Germany kit now, officially. But, you know, it's it's that was still something that was already in the works. And maybe some of these other kit reissues, like the uh, Tom Daniels Bandito uh, uh, 
Volkswagen bus and the 67 GTX and the Escalade and things like that. Other than that stuff that was already in progress in the sense that some of that stuff may have already been run uh, or was, was about to be run as far as the, the molding facility goes. But all those things already have box art that's done. All those things already have decals that are done. All those things already have instructions that have been drawn up. Um, other than that stuff that is very easy for them to, once they have an established way to import their kits out of Germany back into the United States or import them from China to the United States, however they're going to do that, um, from assuming they'll direct ship the stuff uh, that's in China straight back here rather than sending it through Germany to come over here. Um, you're, you know, you're looking at maybe there not being anything else this year out of the whole Ravel U.S. thing, because you have to understand that within the confines of Ravel of Germany, which is now just Ravel and the nominal, you know, figurehead of this combined company. I mean, yes, Blitz owns them and, and all that, but Blitz is a venture capital firm holding company. They don't have any actual experience running a model company. They're going to say, okay, Ravel of Germany, here. Do what you think is best, and we'll, you know, financially support it. Um, you know, they already have their own stuff coming out, right? They have those big scale Porsche, uh, Porsche three fifty sixes they're working on. Uh, there's the large scale conversion for uh, what was it, the Tip One panel van? I think was also coming out. <clears throat> there wasn't a whole lot in one twenty four scale this year at all. Uh, matter of fact, that was the Pirelli GTI. That's pretty much it. Everything else is uh, reissues of uh, existing kits or reissues of Revell USA kits, from my recollection. It's been a while since Nuremberg Toy Fair took place. I could be forgetting something, but I remember, you know, but I do remember that most of the new tool stuff for Revell of Germany this year was focused around those large-scale Porsche uh, 356s. I mean, they still got to run their own business over there, and, and now they have all this other, you know, stuff to the, to the side that they have to deal with. So, uh, I, you know, again, I would not be totally blown away shocked if we did not get anything beyond what was already right there on the cusp of coming out um you know this year it may be 2019 before we start looking at you know them actually doing anything you have to you know what was what was you know what was in in development at Ravel because you know there are loose lips sink ships over there as far as their interaction with the public uh, in terms of what they would talk about, you know, kit you know, kit wise in advance. Um, you know, you obviously would see the third, you know, the 29 Ford, it was something that was supposed to come out. So that's, a, there's a good chance that that'll come back again. So the 30 would be obviously, you know, something else that's, that's an, an easy, quick option there. New drops a new box art for the fact they swap the wheels and en engines between the two kits. But like, what else is you know was cooking over there and behind the scenes remains to be seen. Because some of that stuff may be you know in initial tooling, maybe past initial tooling. I mean, you got to remember that Ravel's financial sh shit show didn't start till January, really. Well, it's not Ravel's, it's Habeco's. But you know, up to then, you have to assume that they were un operating under the premise at least that they would still be in business this year. So there's still a, a third quarter, fourth quarter. Uh, kits that were, like I said, at least an initial design, if not actual like tooling mockups and stuff like that, because obviously, if you're going to produce kits in the, the between the, the months of August and December, <clears throat> you can't wait until July to start working on those things, especially when you're contracting tooling out to another country 12 hours ahead of you. So, uh, now we're done. Sorry, I want to follow the tangent there. Oh, one last thing before I go, if people were watched it this long, because it's not that long in the first place. Uh, Habakkuk released their debtor and possession financing forms yesterday, or maybe it was today. I can't remember when I looked at this, because I check it every day. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, as of the end of February, I think was this what this form was for, Ravel had assets of $15 million between their property and their inventory and their tooling and, you know, their their value of their tooling, obviously not the same as the reality of the value of their tooling. But like I said, uh, Habico had a, had a, you know, a asset, a net positive assets of $15 million. The only thing that really had more money than that was Estes, which had like $43 million. So that's, well, that's a lie. Tower Hobbies had like, Assets of one hundred and forty-seven million dollars, but they have that's all pretty much inventory. <laughs> There's not a lot of you know of, of, of you know their their distribution company. They're they're 
their assets are within what they have in that warehouse, which of course is now over at Horizon Hobbies anyway. But uh, you know, for again, all those people that keep insisting that Ravel went bankrupt, no, 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 no. It was one of the only two. Well, Axel, uh, or uh, Axiol, excuse me, had a little bit of a profit. Not very much of one. It was in the hundreds of dollars, but it still wasn't right. It still wasn't under. But uh, the rest of the Hobico bank, the rest of the Hobico RC stuff was underwater, and uh, so was Hobico, obviously, in general, to the tune of several hundred million dollars. So, uh, for the for the insistent people and for the Revels went back up. No, no, nope, 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 nope. They had assets. That's why they somebody maybe not what you wanted, but somebody bought them. That's why Estes sold too. Anyway, guys, hope you enjoyed it. See you guys.